the best in the world podcast with Richard Parr. Hello and welcome to the most electrifying podcast in sports today, the best in the world with Richard Parr. Is it the most electrifying? Well, I guess that's up for you to decide, but we've got an electrifying guest for you coming up on today's podcast, episode 106 with Steve LeBou. And what is amazing about Steve is that he dives from 27 metres high. Yes, he is a cliff diving competitor, the high diving world champion from the 2017 World Aquatics Championships in Budapest. Only three men have ever won gold in that discipline and Steve is one of them and the reigning champion. He is my guest on this week's Best in the World with Richard Barr. Really good conversation with the American Talks, a whole wide range of topics. He's really good on the level of fear that is needed to compete in cliff diving, in high diving. You don't want to miss that part of the conversation. There's a lot that we can take out from it that we can use in our everyday lives. Listen to that conversation with Steve Laboo. He talks about his life and career before he became a cliff diver, where he was a standard platform diver, and then he worked on cruise ships. He lived in China. We cover all of those things with Steve. He also talks about how his life has now changed, that he's become a father. And we, of course, talk about the time when he hit his head on the platform and then landed in the water 27 metres below. Pretty scary moment for Steve. We talk about all of that on this week's Best in the World with Richard Parr with Steve LeBou. Before we get to that interview, I want to say about Patreon. Patreon is the place where you can support us. We've got a page called patreon.com forward slash best in the world. It's a crowdfunding site where you can help support our show on a regular monthly basis from as low as, I believe, $5. And there's various different tiers going up from up to $5, $10, I think it's $25, $50. The more you help support us, the more great guests we can continue to get on the program and learn from. So that's patreon.com forward slash best best in the world well we certainly will learn a lot from steve Labou. he is the high diving world champion and he's up next on the best in the world the best in the world podcast with richard parr Stephen Labou, high diving world champion. Welcome to the best in the world with Richard Parr. Delighted to get the chance to speak to you. It's just a few months ago that you became the world champion in Budapest. Have you got used to that yet? Well, first, thanks for having me. I'm definitely excited to to be part of the show and and share my story. Um, Yeah, I mean, it's it's sunken in for sure at at this point. we have a pretty long season in the summer with, with high diving and cliff diving. Um, and anytime you do really well, it, it sort of stands out in your mind. So that competition, obviously leaving there, it took a while for it to kind of hit home. And then maybe I remember like a week or two later, I was like, I called my mom. I was like, I'm on a trip. So, uh, <laughs> kind of took some time to, to sink in, but yeah, definitely really, really happy with that one. What else have you looked back on your career and had a similar sensation with then Steven? Uh, well, you know, I, I started cliff diving in 2011 with Red Bull. There's a whole world series that they do. Um, and you know, it's not until 2013 that FINA, the the governing body for aquatics in the Olympics have introduced the sport of high diving into their, you know, their world championship season. So it's still relatively new as a sport in the mainstream. Um, but Red Bull has been doing competitions for a really long time. And um, I had my first competition in 2012 after only competing for a year. So um, to become one of the first guys to win outside of the normal, you know, guys that were sort of cleaning up the sport at the time was was a really big accomplishment and something I hold um, very close to my heart. 
Mm, yeah, an in- incredible achievement. And I'd like to talk a little bit more uh, in particular ab- about that day and everything about it a little bit later in the program. But I, I think it would be quite nice to just get a little bit of a- an understanding of- ab- about you, Steve. And why don't you just tell us a little bit about your childhood growing up and, and where the initial interest in, in diving uh, began? Sure. So I grew up in Ewing, New Jersey, um, on the East Coast of the U.S., and I remember trying sports as a kid. Um, I think a lot of parents do that. You know, they have their kids sort of try as many sports as possible and and sort of see what sticks. Um, And I remember particularly disliking baseball and soccer, um, and I just was not a huge fan of a lot of these team sports that a lot of the other kids were doing. And I remember I I went to like a Learn to Swim program at the age of seven. And at the end, they let you jump off the diving board. It's kind of your reward for, for being good in class. And I remember thinking, man, this is really fun. And then I saw the diving team come in right after that. And I remember looking at my dad and saying, like, this is what I want to do. And that was it. Like, diving stuck. Seven and I had been competing on, a, like, an outside junior Olympic team, just sort of training. Um, I mean, that was my sport all year round. It was outside of school. But, um, yeah, that was my sport from a very, very early age. Mm, so a real commitment uh, I know you you went as far as uh, Olympic trials for 2004 as you were growing up uh, how much time and effort would you have to put in because obviously you've got school and other commitments that every child has uh, what are we talking about in a day are you getting up early are you going straight to the pool after school or are you doing both well it's it's quite interesting actually um, and and as a sport it's all year round um, growing up, especially, I think you get maybe three or four weeks off at the end of summer, maybe. Um, but it's, it's really an all year round commitment. And so, I mean, I can't count the times I've said to my friends, like, Oh, sorry guys, I have dad in practice. Like I can't join you. You know, I would go school from, you know, what the, the full school day and then come home, drop my bags, go to diving for three, three and a half hours, come back, scarf some dinner, try to get some homework done. And it was sort of a wake up repeat thing five days a week. Um, six, you know, we'd have some practice on Saturdays as well. So definitely a huge commitment at a, at a very early age. Mm. Uh, and then you, as I mentioned, you, you got as far as the, uh, the, the 2004 Olympic trials, Where, when did you almost step away from, uh, the, the world of diving competitively? I went to university at Purdue. Um, I went to Olympic trials in 2004, as you mentioned. Um, and even at that time, I was really, really, I was happy with competing, but I was still sort of looking past that. I think after 2004, I had a very realist notion that like, okay, I'm not quite Olympic material. Um, the sport brought me very far. It got me a scholarship to university, which, you know, I was super excited about, but you sort of have that moment where you go like, crap, I'm not, you know, I'm not Olympic material. Um, so I, I really enjoyed competing the next few years after that. It was sort of, you know, I didn't have that huge Olympic drive, but I still was very motivated to do well, obviously for the university and for myself. Um, and then after I was done competing in college, I was really burnt out at that point. And I, I finished competing and I started doing, um, sort of the entertainment side of diving, you know, like you would see in a, an amusement park or you see these high dive setups or, um, things like that. And I was really interested in, in that aspect where you weren't being judged. Um, you know, I was able to just do what I love and what came naturally, you know, without that pressure of being judged. Fantastic. So you mentioned the entertainment there. What, what type of places were you diving at? Well, um, so my first show was at a, um, an amusement park, Six Flags Great Adventure. And they have, they have tanks and um, a high dive ladder set up and you would basically just put on a diving show for crowds of people. Oh, cool. Um, so I, d- I did that there. I did it um, at a place called Indiana Beach near, you know, where I went to university at Purdue. Um, I worked on a Royal Caribbean cruise ship for 10 months. They had a show, like an uh, entertainment show for all the guests on the cruise ship that included a high dive. I worked in China for a year doing live action stunt shows and sort of fine tuning some of those high diving skills and, and other stunt action skills. So um, just sort of performing all around and you learn a ton of things and, and eventually, you know, high diving was one of those things. Wow. How was China for a year? How, how did you cope with the, the culture, the food, the people? How was all of that for you? Man, I thought it was fantastic. I had a really great time and a, a really positive experience in China. Um, I think 
you know, it's, it's a massive country and it, it gets a bad rep sometimes like some of those bigger cities with smog and, and pollution and things like that. But there are some absolutely gorgeous parts of China and I was fortunate enough to live in one of them um, for a year. And I, I mean, it was great. I think if you just immerse yourself in a culture and really try hard, I think, you know, you can sort of enjoy it and kind of even like the locals sort of look at you and they go like, all right, man, at least he's trying, like we'll give him <laughs> some help. But man, I had an absolute blast in China. Oh, amazing. And uh, working on a cruise, uh, it, that that sounds pretty fun. Is it as fun as it sounds? It, You know what? It is it's <laughs> absolutely as fun as it sounds. Um, it's it's very different. I think there's a, you know, there's a lot of rules that crew have to abide by in terms of, you know, guest interaction and where we're allowed to be at certain times. Uh, but it was really exciting. I think, you know, you, you surround yourself with other performers, people that are very passionate about what they do, and you sort of feed off of that. So it's a pretty positive environment in terms of, of learning and, like, honing your skills. Um, and, I mean, you get to you get paid doing what you love. So it, it really is a blast. Oh, that's fantastic. Um, we You mentioned earlier about trying different sports and you, you didn't really like baseball or soccer. Well, one of the things I, I noted here is that you are still pretty good at, at snowboarding and skateboarding. Is that right? That is right. Yeah, I I, I don't know what it was. It's, it's not that I'm interested or not interested in team sports. I, I found the value of team sports I thought very interesting. And, you know, obviously with your friends, that's great. But um, I was always more interested in things that you do to challenge yourself and like challenge your, your own body in a very like individual way. So with skateboarding, it's just you and, and that tool. Like, so you're pushing your body and trying to maneuver this board all on your own. And there's really no outside distractions. You can kind of do your own thing. And same thing with snowboarding and then diving. I mean, you're on a club team and you sort of score points for the whole team in a way, but it, it is very individual. It's you and your body on that board. And, and what you can make yourself do. And so I always found those types of sports that just a little bit more um, appealing. Mm. And we, we've spoken a little bit about travel. And, and as you mentioned in, in 2011, you, you took up high diving and uh, then joined the Red Bull series in 2012. Wh- when did you make that decision to, to take up that sport? What, why did you make that decision? Well, long story long, uh, <laughs> I guess, you know, you spend an entire lifetime acquiring these skills. So I started at the age of seven, um, all the way up through, you know, university. Here I am in China in 2000, just coming home from China in 2010, um, where I got a bunch of high diving experience. And at the end of the day, I have such a passion for the sport that you spend so long acquiring skills that are really, you know, useless outside of the world of diving and, and, you're not ready to let that go yet sometimes. And there are avenues to keep pursuing that passion. And so um, when I came home from China, I had a buddy tell me that, you know, Red Bull was having an open trial in 2011. And um, yeah, just as a commitment to like my, my pure love for the sport, I was like, you know what, I'm going to take this next step. I'm going to challenge all these skills that I have acquired. You know what I mean? Like really put them to the ultimate test and, and cliff diving and high diving is absolutely the ultimate test of, um, your, your skill of diving. So, um, I, yeah, I made that jump. I, I tried out in 2011 and I've just, uh, been doing it ever since. Mm. And it's 27 meters. Certainly that that's what you won the, the world title with. And normally it's say what, 10 meters for, for normal, uh, diving in a, in a pool or a, a Olympic level. Uh, how much scarier is that? It's, it's terrifying. Oh my gosh. It's terrifying every time. And I can't, I can't imagine a single person that competes stepping up there and not, you know, everybody's scared. If you ask anyone they they will say they're scared. If they're not, they're lying. Um, I mean, it's, it's terrifying and you have to, you have to respect that. I think, you know, that's kind of what gets a lot of us by is that we understand our fear and it's a very rational fear. Um, you can get very hurt, but we all respect that. And, and that helps sort of keep you, in the right mind frame. Um, I always say, especially when it comes to fear with high diving, you have to keep your fear in a healthy level. And, and this applies to a lot of sports. If you're overly nervous, maybe you're, you're not thinking clearly and you're going to do something stupid and yeah, you'll probably get hurt. If you're too confident and you don't respect the dangers involved with what you're doing, you're also likely to do something stupid and get hurt. So it's just very important to maintain your, your level of fear when you're facing those types of challenges. How do you do that? 
Stephen, are there any processes that you go through? It's it's definitely a learning process. Um, like anything, it, it takes practice. Um, the, the problem is it's hard to simulate that kind of fear. <laughs> uh, we don't have a Japan plot. There's there's a permanent 27 meter platform in the world at the moment, and it's in Austria, so it's accessible three months out of the year while we're already competing. So it's really not a huge help, but it, it, it's great to have, obviously. So it's hard to sort of simulate that fear in the off season. Um, so really just a lot, a lot of mental and visualization work, really trying to picture everything about a dive and, and sort of making myself nervous on purpose, thinking about it, you know, you're, you know, when you think about something, your, your hands get sweaty and your heart sort of speeds up. I sort of force my, myself to go through that process. I force my body into that. And then I sort of practice calming myself down. So I'll think of um, a trigger that helps sort of bring me back down so I can kind of get my heart rate regulated and um, get my thoughts straight. So it, it just takes a lot of practice. If, if you don't mind me asking, what is your trigger? What, what are some of the things which you think about to help calm you down? No, I don't mind you asking at all. Um, so for me personally, um, when I step onto a platform and you – you recognize the beauty in it. Um, you're, you're standing in a spot that only a handful of people in the world are privy to. You're, you're competing in a sport that, you know, maybe 35 people in the world can do. You spent an entire lifetime kind of building up to that. And there's, I have a really like Zen moment on the platform where all this stuff sort of comes together where there's, you know, 25, 50, 75,000 people in the crowd. And, you know, they're there to watch this thing, this art that we're doing, if you will. And so for me, that all sort of calms me down. And I really try to just embrace the the beauty in it and recognize how fortunate we are to, to do what we love um, in some of the most amazing, beautiful locations you'll see in the world. And that sort of helps center me and, and bring me back to where I need to be. Mm. Which location has been your favorite to dive at? Oh man, I gotta say Thailand. Um, we went to Thailand in 2013, and we we did a couple different locations in in Krabi and Pipidan, and um, I mean, just breathtaking out there. It's it's beautiful. Mm, yeah, a lovely part of the world. I've I've been to Phuket a couple of times. So yeah, it's just, okay, and awesome, uh, excellent food as well. Oh, I love it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, we're, 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 spicy food. So you, you are a fan of spicy food. Was that? Yeah, yeah. So I, I enjoyed Thailand quite a bit. Oh, fantastic! I'm, I want to talk a, a little bit more about uh, diet and food in a moment, but just while we're we're on on the topic of of the the high diving, and as you mentioned, there's only one place in the world to train in Austria, so you're having to dive off platforms, which I'm guessing are, are ten meters. How can that help you? technically practice and, and in some ways uh, i also want to move on to to something which you're famous for is being the, the one man who was able to do five somersaults and i think it was a half a twist uh, in in a in a dive and that requires real innovation how can you do that when you're not training on a 27 meter platform right no fair question um and there is quite a bit that goes into it um I guess first and foremost, a lot of people sort of can paint us as like adrenaline junkies. We're going up, we're doing this thing and we're all just chasing the adrenaline when, you know, in reality, it couldn't be farther from the truth. A lot of what we do is very cold and calculated. And what I always say is the, the adrenaline is a side effect. Um, it, it's going to happen, but what we do leading up to that moment is very calculated and we will spend months training in a pool from 10 meters or, you know, there are other training apparatus or apparatus to use. And, um, I think, you know, what you have to do is a lot of mental work goes into it as well. Cause if you're up on 10 meter, you can do perhaps the first gymnastic portion of the dive. So let's say for example, um, we're going to do back three somersaults with three twists. What I would do is go to 10 meter and I would do one dive and it would be back two somersaults with two and a half twists. And then I would go up and I would just do a front somersault with a half twist. So over the course of two repetitions, I've done the whole dive. And then it's up to me to mentally piece everything together. Mm. So, 
so yeah, a lot of times what will happen is you can break a dive into two or three different repetitions and then practice those three things. And then mentally you have to be able to put it together and, and trust that when you're on the 27 meter platform, the, the takeoff, when you exit and leave the platform, it has to be the same as what you're training on 10 meters. So there's a lot of mental work that goes into it in terms of innovation and creating and, and how we can work towards bigger dives is. Um, for example, they have belts um, on a harness system that would sit over a five meter platform and you could, you know, with someone's assistance, potentially do an unlimited amount of somersaults and, and just practice in a safe manner, exiting the rotations um, at the right time into the water. So there's a ton of different training tools we have. Um, and a lot of it just comes down to, to putting in the work physically first and foremost. And then mentally, obviously, you have to piece everything together as you go. The Best in the World Podcast with Richard Parr. The conversation with Steve continues in just a moment, but before we do that, I want to tell you about one of today's sponsors. And before I tell you that, if you want to be a sponsor on this Best in the World with Richard Parr podcast, send me an email, sportsdesk at sportachino.com. That's sportsdesk at sportachino.com just title it sponsorship or sponsorship for podcast something like that I'm, I'm sure I'll work out which email it is and just think we have an audience here which are interested in high performance in sports in Olympics in world championships and if you believe that your brand has good synergy with this get in touch I'm sure that we can do something great together Today's sponsor is Audible. Audible is one of the leading suppliers of audiobooks in the world. They've got over 180,000 titles for you to choose from for your iPhone, Android, Kindle, MP3 player. I've most recently been listening to Brave New World by Guillaume Balaguer. It's basically a biography of Maurizio Pochettino, the Tottenham manager, throughout the season in 2016 to 2017. I really recommend that you take a listen to it. It's incredible to get this real insight into how a team operates throughout a season. Go and listen to that for free. You can do that by going to audibletrial.com forward slash best. Audible will give you a 30-day free trial to test out their service. That includes one free audiobook download. Perhaps it's Brave New World by Guillaume Balagay. Go and check it out. All right, let's return to the conversation with the high-diving world champion, Steve Labou. The Best in the World Podcast with Richard Parr. We've touched on the mental side um, quite a bit, but what was going through your mind in the moments after you uh, hit your head back in, in La Rochelle in, in 2015 when you were um, trying a, a dive there? Just tell us a little bit about that and also what was going through your mind afterwards. Yeah, I'm dude. I'm infamous for that <laughs> platform hit. Uh, aren't you called the Miracle Man now, Steve? Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, yeah. Press they like their nicknames. <laughs> but, uh, no, it was honestly, it was a very, very scary moment um, when things like that happen. It, it's very quick, um, and I never reflect that moment. And basically, my my overall analysis is just that. Um, I let, I let my fear get out of a comfortable range and I do have some bad habits, obviously from my diving career. Like I was never, like I said, not Olympic material. So I do have some bad habits that can create, um, dangerous situations like that. And, and I had been working to correct those, but I think once, you know, like I said, I let my fear sort of get out of that level, man, I, I, I did what's called hipping in. So I jumped too close to the platform and I ended up hitting my just above left eye and uh, managed to land in the water safely after falling 90 feet. And then, you know, like I said, everything happens really quickly. The scariest part of all of that for me was in two weeks from that exact moment, I had to do it again in the next competition. There's no withdrawing or, you know, in my mind, there's no withdrawing or, or doing something different like that was I had to get up and do it again. So that was a little bit more taxing on me than the actual accident. Mm. And how, how was the actual landing in the water? Because I, I can 
uh, I've heard that if you don't dive in uh, cleanly into the water, it can actually be really painful from that height. It can. Um, I think, you know, under those circumstances, maybe if I had done just that entry on its own, I may have been a little rattled. I don't know that would have had any injury per se just from that. Mm. Um, there's always sort of potential for like a, a torn or pulled muscle or like even a strain. Um, but, you know, when something like that happens, uh, I think my adrenaline immediately went up. I managed to, to guide myself to the water relatively safely, I think. And um, so at that point, I was just so kind of jacked up on adrenaline. The entry was uh, sort of a moot point. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the adrenaline probably running through your veins. So we mentioned food, spicy food. What, what's your favorite thing to eat then, Stephen? Oh, that's a loaded question, man. I <laughs> I love food. Uh, I think I'm I'm perpetually just a little bit out of shape because I love food and and I'm okay with that. Like <laughs> if you know if if being world champion for years to come meant I had to give up food, then I would settle for a second or third place and take the food. <laughs> well, now you are world champion. You can eat whatever you want. <laughs> that's right. Yeah. No, I um, you know I. I'm, I don't maintain any particular diet per se, but I do try to control portion size. Just be smart with, with what I'm eating. Nothing crazy all the time. You know, I, I don't mind once a week having, you know, nachos or pizza or whatever. But, uh, uh, I guess Thai food, man. I really like Thai food and Japanese food. So big fan of sushi and, um, curries and things like that. Mm. Can you handle your spice? Uh, I like to think so. Yeah, I'm I'm always willing to try something um, spicy. And I guess, you know, it's important to have flavor, though, you know what I mean? If it's just burning the tongue out of your mouth for no reason, then uh, I don't see too much point in that. But I, I do enjoy a good spice. Like, if it's a good tasty curry and it's got some heat on it, uh, I'm all for it. I like when, you know, my hair starts sweating. That's the good stuff. <laughs> There's a place not too far away from me which does spicy chicken wings, and... They've got this one spice called the Viper. And what they'll do is you can you can order eight different chicken wings and one of them is the Viper, but you don't know which one it is. So it's called a snake in the basket. <laughs> and a Russian roulette game. I, I had it once and I, I didn't think I'd be able to speak for about 10, 15 minutes. And I thought the pain would oh. never go away. But I've been in that um, that bar restaurant since and I've seen people crying <laughs> just water yeah. tearing from Maybe their a eyes too much <laughs> uh but the, the, apart from that they're actually delicious so <laughs> i always end up going back there but yeah it's it, oh, even, even when you think you can handle spice sometimes there's always something around the corner which uh, can catch you out yeah no i fully fully agree um I, I wanted to talk a little bit about your your family Stephen and uh, in in 2016 you you became a father congratulations how did that affect your you. your your life as as a high diver at all uh, it man it was interesting it was very different than i expected and i think that's why you know, if I just maybe had a little less expectation and just kind of played it by ear and let it flow, I think it would have been all right. But I think I was expecting to have this overwhelming feeling of like pressure on my shoulders to provide, um, you know, and I, I imagine anyone that has a family or, you know, 90% of the people that have a family feel the same way. You know, am I going to be able to provide for my family? Can I feed them and keep a roof over the head? And um, those are very normal fears, I think, in, in daily life. So, when when my daughter came along, actually, it was quite the opposite. I felt very relieved, um, and I, in years past, I've been quite concerned with my my overall like positioning because it is um, it's prize money on a sliding scale. So how well you do directly affects how much money you make and how much you know you're able to provide for your family in turn. So I had put a lot of pressure on myself in the past, but it had, like I said, quite the opposite effect. Where it was it was very freeing. Where like that cliff diving was almost a vacation from <laughs> from being a dad of a toddler of an infant so i kind of went there and was like you know what even if this all ended right now i have something more important in my life that is going on and, and something that i can take care of so uh it was 
like I said, very freeing. It sort of relieved a lot of that pressure for me. So obviously now traveling as he's getting older is, is getting a little more difficult because she realizes I'm gone all the time. Mm-hmm. Um, but in terms of just having a daughter and how that really affected, um, you know, my life and, and the sport in general, um, all, all positive stuff. And I'm sure in those uh, uh, future years, she'll be watching you on YouTube or on, on the Red Bull website going, oh, d- there's daddy. <laughs> I hope so. I hope so. Yeah, I don't want to. I don't want to be a lifer uh, in the sport. Obviously, the the you can't do it forever. It takes quite a toll on the body. But um, yeah, I've got a good few years left, and and just going to put everything I have into it, and hopefully have a couple more successful seasons. And and uh, man, I'd love to take her to an event. I took her to Texas uh, this past year, but she not quite there like in terms of of recognizing what's going on so maybe in another year or so we'll get her out to a cool location Mm. and your wife was also a very talented diver so does that mean there's going to be another talented diver in the family then (laughs) (laughs) we'll see she definitely loves uh i i throw her around and flip her around a lot um she loves swimming class uh you know if she wants to do it, that's cool. I'm I'm gonna sit by and, and let her go. But uh, I just want her to be in in some sort of sport. I think you know most parents same thing. Just kind of want her to be active, whatever she chooses. Obviously, we'll be fine with that. But yeah, I think we'll definitely give diving a try. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. Well, let let let's round this interview up where we began. Let's let's talk about Budapest. Tell me about how that that whole experience went for you and and also um was there anything different about this event and the preparation you did in certain things which happened that was perhaps different to say other events at all well looking back and i like i said i've done a ton of reflection on on this event in particular um it was this event was at the end of july so it was for us we had been on the road competing on Red Bull and some other competitions the whole month of July. So every single weekend we had a competition and it was interesting because this was the last competition. Everyone was a little sore, a little beat up, but, but pretty comfortable at least with the the height, like feeling more comfortable after you do it, you know, a little bit in a row, you start to loosen up a little bit. Um, so I was at least feeling really good mentally. And yeah, it, it's interesting because I compete against all the same guys throughout the whole year and i'm i'm sort of a roller coaster type guy i can do really well or i can not even you know make finals it just depends on the the day um and i just remember coming in that second day and feeling really good about everything mentally i was in a good position um you know in the competition so i just felt like i was sort of in a position to kind of take control and yeah it's weird man and a lot of athletes can tell you especially the elite ones there's something about like you know you hear people say getting in the zone um and it's really hard to replicate like when it happens it just happens and you sort of feel it and things just sort of go their way and it's all very natural and and that's how i felt i was sort of outside of myself watching everything happen um so it was a pretty pretty cool experience and it was nice to to get a win obviously in, in what was the most important competition of the year we have touched on getting in the zone with a few of our other guests before. Um, have you had that experience any other time in your career? I have, definitely, yeah. There's been times, too, where, um, you know, I've had a couple victories on tour. That obviously sets in there. And then there's even times when you don't win, but, like, maybe just it comes together for you and you do, you know, pretty well. There are times when you kind of get in the zone, whether it's, for the whole competition or not. But yes, I have had experiences with that feeling. Um, And yeah, if if we knew how to replicate it, obviously there would be a ton of really great athletes in the world, but it comes (laughs) and goes as it does. And uh, yeah. Uh, Well, hopefully if I keep doing this podcast and keep speaking to you world and Olympic champions, uh, we'll we'll, we'll get to find out exactly how it's done. (laughs) But uh, Yeah, we'll find that that common denominator there. (laughs) Hopefully one day. Well, Stephen, it's been really good to speak to you and to learn from you and hear about all of your amazing career. Uh, Just before you go, can you let us know where we can continue to follow your journey online or if there's anything else you'd like to mention? Fantastic, and thank you very much. I appreciate um, all the time here. Um, You can follow my personal page on um, Instagram or Twitter at Ive Labu and um yes Stephen Labu on Facebook and then if you want to follow along with the Red Bull Cliff Diving World Series 
you can go to redbullcliffdiving.com. Um, they have all the latest info on all the divers competing in the World Series as well as um, some of the wild cards. And you can kind of look back on video and familiarize yourself with the sport. If you haven't checked it out yet, I recommend that. Also, you can follow USA Cliff Diving, which is, um, you know, the four USA guys kind of banded together and we've got a, a good thing going. We're kind of generating a lot of content. So if you're just interested in hanging out and watching some cliff diving, that's a good one too. Mm, superb. It's definitely one of the best sports, I think, to watch visually. Uh, what you guys do is incredible. And it's been incredible speaking to you, Stephen. Thank you for being on the program and thank you for being the best in the world. No problem at all. Thank you. The Best in the World podcast with Richard Parr. Great to talk to Steve on the podcast. Steve's not the only high diver that we've had on this program. Gary Hunt has been on this podcast. Maybe go back and listen to that episode. We've had a few swimmers on as well. Nathan Adrian's been on the podcast. Natalie Coglin. They're all in the back catalogue. Plus, we did talk about fear with Steve. And Casper Steinfaff was on the program only a few weeks ago. Go and listen to that podcast. He is a paddleboard world champion with an excellent insight on the topic of fear. Go and check that out. They're all available at Apple Podcasts, on Stitcher, on Acast, on Podbean, and of course at sportachino.com. All right, that's it for this week's podcast. I will be back next Thursday with another episode of The Best in the World with Richard Parr. Goodbye. The Best in the World podcast with Richard Parr.